Okay, so first, why quantum information? So this is um, a small classical computer in 2019. I remember Professor Mazari had said that you can run quantum espresso for silicon on the phone. So this is our very small computer now. And this is what a quantum computer might look like. So why bother to move from our small classical computers to this uh, compu quantum computer that looks very cumbersome and inconvenient? Well, the answer is that quantum computers can potential, potentially provide new solutions to unsolved problems and also simulate quantum phenomena faster than the classical computers. So for example, quite long ago in the 1980s, Peter Shaw had proven that you can use quantum computers to find the prime factors of large integers, and this is something that a classical computer cannot do. And it's also the basis of the RSA cryptography that is the most widely used public key cryptography now. Okay, so now if the quantum computer can solve this problem, it means that there's a problem with the cryptography that we use now. So we also have quantum cryptography that will allow secure transfer of information across long distances. And even uh, more interesting, quantum teleportation, where you transfer the wave packet from one place to another using quantum methods, but still uh, within the speed of light. And how do they do this? Well, here on the left, you see the classical bit of zero or one. And the qubit, which is a quantum bit, is a superposition of two states, zero and one. Okay. So you can see that here that the qubit has a lot more information than the classical bit. Okay. But a lot of this information is hidden in the sense that you can't measure directly what the coefficients of zero and one are. Or once you measure it, this, the state is destroyed. So quantum information is about how one can manipulate this hidden information to perform amazing tasks. So one example here is the Bell state, which is the basis of quantum teleportation. Okay, so the Bell state is what one might call an entangled state, because you can't set factorize it into a direct product of two different states. Okay, so that's the entanglement in your title. And how do you physically realize the qubit? So you saw that humongous uh, quantum computer on the first slide. Well, it's not easy. So these are some conditions that would have to be satisfied. First, you need to have a robust representation of quantum information, which typically means you have a finite number of possible levels, such, such as in a spin three-half particle. Then you need to be able to control the quantum state, and this is very tricky. And you need to be able to prepare initial states with sufficiently long lifetimes. Okay, and this is challenging if you are not in the ground state or not in the completely random state. And also you have to measure the output result. Most of the commonly studied qubits nowadays involve either spin, charge, or photons. And in this session, we are going to focus on spin where we would look at localized spin centers in atoms, molecules, or condensed phase. So what's the role of first principles calculations here? Well, we can elucidate the quantum state in localized spin centers, and the challenge would be to look at understand the excited states, and also because localized spins often have strong correlations, as you have heard in the second session, uh, we would uh, typically might need to go beyond DFT use, using a DMFT for fluctuating spins and to capture intrasite correlations. Okay. And as you saw in the previous slide, lifetimes are very important, so it would be good if we can predict the lifetimes of excited states as the first speaker will be talking about. And we also want to be able to predict experimental observables for measurements and understand how the system interacts with the environment so that we can control it. Okay, so without further ado, I would go, like to introduce the first speaker for this session, 
Professor Christian Van de Waal from the University of California at Santa Barbara, who's telling us about modeling points defects for quantum information science. Thank you. I am very pleased to uh, be here at this uh, excellent conference, and I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. It's the first time I have a chance to speak at the Total Energy Workshop, and it's a real honor for me. So, uh, let's see, we need to switch over to my computer somehow. Thank you. So I'd first like to acknowledge the uh, people who've been uh, involved in this work. First and foremost, Aldrius Alkauskas uh, and uh, various other people who are currently or formerly members of my group. Uh, a number of these people have moved on to uh, other positions in the meantime. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank David Afshalom, who used to be at UCSB, for uh, introducing me to this field. And uh, by the way, uh, on the program, it lists my first name as Christian. Uh, I don't know who uh, put the program together. They must have had access to government files or something like that, because that's the only place where uh, the word, uh, the, my name is actually spelled as Christian. I go by Chris, okay. So um, our chair introduced uh, the topic very nicely. Uh, we want to manipulate quantum information and kind of in the simplest possible picture of that, what you would like to do is, is take um, localized wave functions, the way you have them in an atom, the way we study them, for instance, in the hydrogen atom in introductory quantum courses, and manipulate those wave functions, okay? So you would want to somehow trap that atom uh, and then address those wave functions uh, somehow. Um, and some implementations of uh, qubits or single spin centers actually try to do that with trapped ions uh, or molecules, or you can think about quantum wells or, or quantum dots. But actually a very attractive way of simulating such a trapped atom is to do it with a point defect in a semiconductor or, or insulator, okay? Uh, point defects used to be referred to as color centers. They were widely studied in alkali halides, but of course, in the context of semiconductors, they have been widely studied because they are usually bad objects that degrade the performance of a device. But here, we are actually going to be using them uh, to design single spin centers or in the case you want photons, uh, single photon uh, uh, sources. So these will form our solid state system uh, where quantum information can actually be, be manipulated at, at room temperature. So in my talk, I will actually not so much talk about the actual quantum computing aspects or, or the, the manipulating the quantum information, but the uh, actual implementation uh, in the context of materials of uh, these uh, single photon sources or single spin centers. And the prototype uh, of this, of course, as, as uh, you probably all know, is the nitrogen uh, vacancy center in Diamond, which I will uh, talk about as an example. Uh, so just to uh, elaborate a bit on, on the importance of this, uh, if you actually have access to such single spin centers or single photon sources, you can create, control, manipulate non-classical states of light and matter, and, and that will really enable us to go beyond classical limits, uh, not just in computing, uh, but also in quantum information science, uh, for instance, with quantum cryptography. And another very interesting application is actually to do extremely sensitive imaging and sensing. So in the case of single spin centers, such as the NV center in Diamond, where, where you want to manipulate the spin, uh, it turns out that uh, to uh, initialize and to manipulate that spin, you want to use light, okay? So that's 
already one manifestation of the fact that you want to really understand the fundamentals of light absorption and emission. Uh, another way to, to use these uh, uh, atomic centers is to generate single photons, which are then used for, for instance, uh, quantum key distribution. And again, clearly you need to understand fundamentals of uh, light absorption and emission in such centers. So as I said, in the, in the NV center in diamond, this has already been widely studied. Uh, in diamond, you can remove a carbon atom, create a vacancy. If you have a nitrogen atom uh, next to that, uh, you create a point defect that has extremely interesting properties. It can function as a qubit uh, at room temperature or even at elevated temperature. It has a long coherence time. It's optically addressable. Uh, and, and so it has come to serve as, as kind of a, a prototype for such uh, single spin centers. And the electronic structure is actually reasonably uh, straightforward. On the left-hand side, I illustrate it in a single particle uh, picture. You have a wide band gap, which means that the defect levels associated with the center uh, which occur somewhere in the middle of the band gap, are well separated from the band edges, uh, which, which is important for uh, the coherence. Uh, and then these uh, levels in, in the particular symmetry of the NV center are A1 levels and E levels. They are occupied with electrons uh, in this way. In the particular uh, charge state uh, that, that you want for this center, which is actually a negative charge state, uh, you have an S equal one ground state. And then by exciting an electron optically out of this A1 level to an E level, uh, you uh, 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 can actually get it into an excited state, as is illustrated on the right-hand side here. Um, and the uh, uh, energy of that optical transition is 1.945 EV. Uh, and uh, of course, then, then you get also luminescence uh, around that energy. Um, now, if you look at this uh, in more detail and look at the magnetic structure, uh, you actually find that uh, there are a number of possible transitions between these magnetic sublevels uh, possible. And uh, it turns out that uh, there is actually another possibility instead of this optical transition to go from the excited state to the ground state via this intermediate level, this is referred to as the intersystem crossing. And uh, these transitions actually are non-radiative transitions. And they are very important because they actually enable you to initialize the system in this ms equals zero ground state, so to have a, a particular uh, spin state uh, for the center. So I'm using this as an illustration to show that both non-radiative and radiative transitions need to be thoroughly understood. On the radiative side, uh, here's a luminescence spectrum measured for the NV center. This 1.945 EV actually corresponds to the so-called zero phonon line, which I will uh, tell you a little bit more about soon. Um, but as you can see, there is actually a, a very uh, uh, wide uh, sideband, which is caused by vibronic coupling, coupling to phonons, uh, which you need to thoroughly understand to really understand the properties of, of this system. So that's uh, what we set ourselves as a goal to uh, study these line shapes um, and also to understand non-radiative recombination. So we use uh, our formalism that uh, we developed uh, some time ago, and this is actually a, a review article that uh, can kind of serve as a manual for how to do these first principles calculations for uh, uh, point defects in, in solids. Um, we calculate the formation energy of the defect. I won't uh, say much about that, uh, but that uh, obviously gives you information about how likely it is that a certain defect can actually be formed in the solid in case you're uh, looking to design new types of single spin centers. 
Um, the specific example I'm giving here and that I'm going to be using throughout the talk is actually for, not for the, uh, diamond, but for gallium nitride, uh, which is a semiconductor that we have studied in a lot of detail, uh, partly for the quantum information science applications, but also because it is the uh, main material used for solid state lighting, which, which is an extremely important uh, technology in its own right. So for this particular example, uh, my quote unquote point defect is actually an impurity. I use the word point defect in a generic sense. It could be an intrinsic uh, native defect or it could be an impurity. The formalism is general. Uh, I focus here on carbon sitting on a nitrogen site in gallium nitride. This is the definition of the formation energy. Um, and uh, this can be generalized for any point defect or, or impurity. So uh, we can calculate this. We use density functional theory. Uh, we uh, don't use the traditional LDA or GGA functionals because uh, they have severe shortcomings. The most widely known one is the band gap problem. Uh, if you're interested in calculating defects levels in the band gap, obviously if you have an underestimation of the band gap, uh, it becomes very difficult to get quantitative information. And we have been using hybrid functionals, particularly the, the screened hybrid functional of Heitz, Kuzeria, and Enzerhof uh, to overcome that problem. Um, I'd like to point out that there is actually another major advantage to using uh, this hybrid functional, namely that you get a much more accurate description of uh, charge localization. Uh, which LDA and, and GGA fail to provide, and particularly when you're looking at point defects, where uh, uh, particularly the, the wave functions of holes uh, tend to be localized on particular orbitals, uh, the uh, hybrid functional turns out to, to give an accurate description of that, as we have verified in a number of uh, benchmark studies. So, coming then to the issue of, of uh, calculating radiative and uh, non-radiative recombination. So in, in uh, the examples that I'm going to give, I'm going to assume that we have a recombination process between a carrier in a band edge, either the conduction band or, or the valence band, and a localized defect level. Everything I'm saying can also be applied to so-called internal transitions, where you would have a transition between two levels that are localized on uh, the defect. In a radiative process, obviously the energy uh, that you gain by recombining, for instance, uh, an electron with a hole on the defect level is emitted as a photon. In a non-radiative process, uh, the energy will be dissipa dissipated in the form of phonons. So, um, how do we uh, calculate line shapes then? Well, we all know how to calculate uh, the strength of an optical transition uh, by, by calculating the dipole matrix element, uh, but these very broad uh, line shapes that in the case of carbon and gallium nitride were already measured uh, back in 1980, um, this requires a description of the uh, interaction with the lattice interaction with phonons. So I briefly uh, want to show you the, the underlying principles of this, which are very general. We, we think about this problem in the context of a, a so-called configuration coordinate diagram. Um, we can do a calculation for carbon sitting on a nitrogen site in gallium nitride in a particular charge state. And when we uh, just let our modern electronic structure codes run, they would immediately uh, optimize the structure and give us the minimum energy position as a function of the atomic positions. Uh, but in reality, atoms move even at zero temperature, uh, there's zero point motion, uh, and when transitions are going to take place, uh, the atoms are going to move. So we can actually map out around the minimum what the shape of the potential energy surface is, illustrated here in one dimension, as a function of what I call a configuration coordinate, which is kind of a, a, a common term for describing a, a whole set of atomic coordinates. 
So I do that for one particular charge state. I can do it equally well for another charge state, uh, for instance, the neutral charge state, and I've added an electron here to conserve charge between these two transitions. And then um, if, uh, if we look at uh, this curve here, yeah, it has a similar shape, but its minimum may occur for a different set of atomic coordinates because you've now uh, uh, change the, the charge, and so the atoms may want to assume uh, different positions. Optical transitions will take place, for instance, absorption, uh, taking an electron um, out of uh, this defect level and putting it into the conduction band would take energy. Uh, a vertical transition would occur with uh, uh, this amount of energy, and that's, uh, that vertical transition will probably be the strongest uh, signature that you will have in an optical uh, line shape. After the transition has taken place, the system, of course, relaxes to, to its minimum, and then you can subsequently have emission or luminescence, and you immediately see there is a difference in energy between where you expect the peak of absorption and the peak of emission uh, to be, so that's the uh, well-known Stoke shift. Um, so that's the principle of it. We can calculate that in practice. Again, carbon and gallium nitride. Uh, we uh, uh, see what the energies are of these various transitions. The transition that would take place between the minima of these two curves is the so-called zero phonon line. Okay. Um, as I said before, the uh, most prominent uh, peak in an optical emission process would occur for this vertical transition, which for this carbon impurity would be at about 2.1 uh, eV. Now, if we want to uh, get the actual optical line shape out of this, we need to uh, couple this description to a description of uh, vibrations in the system. And here's our configuration coordinate diagram again. And then we need to take into account that for each of these curves, for the ground state and for the excited state, since they describe the energy as a function of atomic position, there will be vibrational modes in a one-dimensional picture. And if these would be roughly parabolic, uh, you can think of it as, as simple harmonic oscillators with equally spaced energy levels, which actually turns out in many cases to be a remarkably good description of, of what's going on. So these uh, horizontal lines illustrate these vibrational levels, and then it immediately becomes obvious that the transitions that are actually going to take place uh, are not just from these uh, solid uh, dark curves here, but are actually going to be transitions between these various uh, vibrational levels, which then ultimately leads to a luminescence uh, spectrum that can be quite broad, okay? Um, the uh, uh, energy uh, that needs to be dissipated for instance, after making a luminescence transition and going back to the ground state will be dissipated in the form of vibrations. Uh, and a uh, very uh, common uh, measure for that is the so-called Huang Ris factor, which is basically this relaxation energy divided by the typical vibrational frequency for these transitions. Okay, so if the two curves for ground and excited states are pretty much aligned with each other in terms of where their minimum is, then this one Ries factor will be very small. Okay? That's the case, for instance, if you have transition metals in, in oxides, chromium and aluminum oxide. In that case, all of the energy of the transition is essentially concentrated in the so-called uh, zero phonon line. Most transitions are not that way. Uh, in many cases, you have significant uh, relaxation energy, significant coupling to vibrations, and in addition to the zero phonon line, you have this fairly wide phonon sideband, which may have significant structure. If the Huang Ries factor becomes very large, in case the, the uh, relaxation energy is really uh, uh, much larger than, than the uh, typical vibrational frequency, uh, for instance, 
in F centers in all halides, uh, you mostly get to see this wide sideband and the zero phonon line becomes actually very hard to detect. Now, from the point of view of, of computations, this last case is actually uh, the case that, that is uh, uh, most readily described because for that case we have shown that a one-dimensional model in which we describe the vibronic states uh, in, in terms of a single coordinate uh, actually does a remarkably uh, good job. And then we can, we can just calculate uh, a normalized luminescence intensity within the Frank Condon approximation, uh, calculate these vibronic overlap integrals in, in one dimension, uh, and for instance, for our carbon impurity in gallium nitride, we've done this for a number of examples, but you can see uh, the agreement between our theoretical description and experiments, which are these circles, is very, very good, uh, which really gives us a benchmark for saying that, that uh, we do uh, very well in terms of describing these, uh, these line shapes, particularly in the case of large lattice relaxations, large wang Ries factors. Uh, we can also do it in the case of intermediate values of the huang Ries factor, uh, and that's what um, we've tested in the case of the NV center in, in Diamond, where you see this uh, structured uh, phonon sideband. Uh, so here's the configuration coordinate diagram for the NV center in Diamond. Uh, here's the electronic structure uh, once again. And based on that configuration coordinate diagram, again, we can put all the vibrations into it, but we can't do it anymore in a one-dimensional model. We would not be able to, to match the details of the experimental line shape. Um, we actually are forced to take uh, uh, a three-dimensional picture and individual phonons into account, uh, both the lattice phonons as well as uh, more localized phonons uh, in the vicinity of the defect in order to be able to uh, reproduce the experimentally observed structure of this phonon sideband. Uh, this was the status of um, uh, these calculations as of a few years ago. In the meantime, Aldrius Alkauskas has actually um, been able to uh, optimize the description even further, uh, such that the, uh, the overlap between uh, the uh, theoretical curve and the experimental curve is, is uh, essentially perfect. Um, so this gives us a very important tool for helping identify uh, single photon centers in, in materials and also for designing single photon centers. Um, the NV center has gotten a lot of publicity, but it's really not an ideal center. Uh, the zero phonon line is the line that you're going to use in the quantum applications, okay? Uh, but as you can already see, just by visual inspection of this centrum, uh, of this uh, spectrum, the zero phonon line has quite a low overall intensity. It's only like less than 3% of the overall uh, intensity of the emission here. So you're basically uh, working with a very inefficient emitter from the point of view of, of using it for quantum information. So the search is currently on for centers where most of the intensity is actually concentrated in the zero phonon line. So the ability to calculate these line shapes uh, is, is really very valuable. So let me switch gears and talk about non-radiative uh, recombination. We're going to be using the same ingredients, the same principles, uh, but now uh, not for optical transitions, uh, but for uh, transitions that are mediated uh, by phonons. So the context in, in which non-radiative uh, recombination is often discussed is once again for uh, defects in materials uh, where the defects are playing a detrimental role and are uh, uh, trapping carriers either by trapping electrons from the conduction band or uh, trapping holes from the valence band. This was a problem that, that uh, was uh, recognized uh, 
more than half a century ago by uh, Shockley and, and Reed and Hall in the early uh, 50s uh, and flagged as, as an important obstacle for making highly efficient electronic devices. Uh, so while it was flagged as an obstacle in terms of doing quantitative calculations of these rates of capture, uh, that uh, hadn't really been possible until recently uh, with the advent of, of highly accurate electronic structure calculations, but also calculations of, of uh, phonons as well as electron phonon interactions. So we want to calculate these rates, for instance, how an electron gets trapped on a defect level like this. Uh, it's a product of, of uh, these three factors. Obviously, the number of electrons that are available, the number of defects that are present in the particular charge state that will capture an electron, and most of the information uh, is in this uh, uh, capture coefficient, um, which is what we are actually going to, uh, to be calculating. And again, we do that with the aid of these configuration uh, coordinate diagrams. Uh, so there are uh, three curves here, uh, because ultimately, uh, you first want to capture an electron and then go to a state where you can capture a hole and, and then basically the cycle has been uh, completed. So the transitions between these various curves here are now not transitions that are mediated by photons, but what we are going to do is, for instance, if we start in the upper curve, make a transition to the curve below it by using energy provided by lattice vibrations to cross over between these two curves. So if this were a classical picture, you would immediately know what the barrier for that process is. It would be a thermally activated process whereby you really have to go up this amount of energy to be able uh, to cross over. But this is quantum mechanics and we don't need to go all the way to that crossing point. We can uh, have a quantum mechanical process to make these transitions and that's what we can explicitly calculate. Uh, the, the formula we use for that is essentially Fermi's golden rule where you recognize a matrix element squared. Uh, there should be a density of states which is included in this energy conserving uh, delta function uh, which when summed or integrated over all of the possible electronic states that reflects the density of states. Uh, the uh, electron phonon uh, coupling is what enters into this matrix element and uh, we can calculate that uh, very accurately. The uh, uh, formula is actually on the right hand side uh, here. This is the matrix element that we need to calculate and with some simple manipulations you can actually reformulate that in terms of an overlap uh, between a wave function and uh, a uh, wave function at a uh, different set of atomic positions. And, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, have extracted uh, these uh, matrix elements um, based on different possible codes with the help of uh, Georg Kresse. Uh, we were recently able to, uh, to also obtain this uh, in VASP. Um, so we combine this information with the information about the configuration uh, coordinate diagrams that, that we already have and again, Carbon and gallium nitride served as our benchmark because it has been so well studied. Uh, I'm plotting here the capture coefficients for holes onto a carbon level in gallium nitride. I'm plotting it as a function of temperature. The red curve is what we calculate. The blue diamonds are experimental values and you see the agreement is, is really very good. So if I have a few more minutes, no, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I wanna make one more point, uh, which is about um, conventional wisdom in terms of uh, the uh, position of defect levels in the band gap to give you maximum non-radiative uh, recombination. Um, Going back as far as Shockley and Reed and Hall, uh, when people have thought about um, centers that are going to be highly efficient non-radiative centers, they've usually thought about levels that need to be in the middle of the band gap. The reason for that is 
kind of intuitive. The rate with which you can capture, for instance, an electron from the conduction band becomes lower and lower the farther away this defect level is from the conduction band. Okay. And conversely, the hole capture rate becomes lower if the defect level is farther away from the valence band. So combining those two principles, you immediately say, well, if you want to have a center that can capture both electrons and holes, it needs to be somewhere in the middle of the band gap. We recently found an important exception to that, which is also very relevant for identifying centers for quantum information. Um, we looked at transition metal impurities in gallium nitride, looking at iron, for instance, the iron level is very close to the conduction band. It's within half an EV of the conduction band. So you would say very strong non-radiative capture of electrons. That's obvious. You would think the non-radiative rate for capturing holes would be very low or even non-observable. Experimentally, however, it was found the rate for capturing holes was as high as the rate for capturing electrons. I don't have time to go through the complete story, but we've been able to explain this based on taking into account that a transition metal impurity such as iron has excited states, very easy to, say, to see within the D-state manif manifold. You can put electrons in excited states that correspond to higher line D states. And if you take those excited states into account, you can actually calculate rates that are very close to the experimentally observed rates. So that's the context in, in which we uh, came across this, but we find this to be a very uh, general issue. Uh, for instance, this is an example for a gallium vacancy complex in gallium nitride that careful consideration of excited states, and you may notice that this sort of picture is actually very similar to, to what we calculate for the NV center in, in diamond, these excited states can play an extremely important role in non-radiative recombination and going beyond quantum information. Uh, this, in our opinion, also explains why defects can still be important non-radiative centers in extremely wide gap, band gap materials or even insulators where the traditional picture based on energy difference between defect level and bandage would, would tell you uh, non-radiative recombination would not be important. So um, I'll just put up my conclusion slides here. Uh, I will actually leave you with, with a slide of references in case you're interested in the more details. And uh, I'll stop here and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.